it's not often that there's silence waiting in anticipation, but uh, uh, normally you have to uh, call a uh, peace and quiet to, to start, but uh, uh, it's call a pass, so we'll make a, make a start uh, prompt on time. Shall we pray? <coughs> oh God, we're grateful that you have given us your word. <coughs> uh, we give thanks that you are not a remote God, uh, but that you are a God who, having created and having redeemed, is a God who is intimately interested uh, in uh, your creation. And so, our Father, we give thanks uh, that we can come once again to listen to your voice. And we pray that as we do so, uh, that you would help our hearts and our minds to respond. And that uh, both in word and in life, uh, there might be a response of worship uh, because of all that you are and all that you have done. And so, bless our time, we pray as we give thanks in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. I'd like to turn please again to Ephesians chapter 3. If we... <coughs> Excuse me. Ephesians chapter 3. Uh, we looked at verses 1 through to 13 last time I spoke. Um, so we're going to finish off the chapter uh, today. Um, but we're going to read the whole chapter because uh, really verses 14 through to 21 are the response to the earlier verses and so uh, it'd be good just to once again read through what the Apostle Paul has said uh, so that we understand why he responds in the way that he does at the end of the chapter so Ephesians chapter 3 verse 1 for this reason I Paul the prisoner of Christ Jesus for you Gentiles now if we just remind ourselves when he says for this reason He's been speaking just in the previous chapter about uh, the great joy and privilege uh, of, of uh, Jew and Gentile coming together into one body. Uh, and it's for this reason I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for you Gentiles. It was for this reason that the Apostle Paul was in prison. Now, by rights, uh, we probably should then jump straight down to verse 14. For uh, if you notice in verse 14, it says, for this reason. Uh, and it's kind of like in verse 14, he's continuing what he was going to say in verse number one. But in verses two through to 13, he elaborates further on the greatness of the privilege that he, the apostle, had in being the one to reveal the mystery of, of the church of Jew and Gentile coming together into one body. So we'll read verses 2, 3 to 13, which is kind of really like a parenthesis uh, before he continues his prayer. Verse 2, If indeed you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which was given to me for you, how that by revelation he made known to me the mystery as I have briefly written already, by which, when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known to the sons of men, as it has now been revealed by the Spirit to his holy apostles and prophets, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the, should be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ through the gospel of which I became a minister, according to the gift of the grace of God given to me by the effective working of his power. To me, who am less than the least of all the saints, this grace was given, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ, and to make all see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the ages has been hidden in God, who created all things through Jesus Christ, to the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places, according to the eternal purpose which he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through faith in him. Therefore, I ask that you do not lose heart at my tribulations for you, which is your glory. 
And so having revealed to them uh, the great privilege that he, the apostle, had of revealing the great truth of the church. He who considered himself less than the least of all saints. He was the one that God had given the privilege of revealing this great demonstration of the manifold wisdom of God to principalities and powers. And so he says in verse 14, Therefore, For this reason, I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might through his Spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and length and depth and height, to know the love of Christ which passeth knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us, to him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. And we look to God to bless uh, this reading of his word uh, together. If you remember, uh, at the end of chapter 1, Uh, The Apostle Paul, um, having considered the greatness of the blessings that we enter into because we are in Christ, he paused and he prayed for the people of God. And in chapter 1, verses uh, 15 through to the end, uh, he prays such things that... uh, we should be encouraged to pray as well. Uh, So often we uh, get tied up, don't we, in praying for the the physical and the material and the temporal. But when we come to read the Apostles' prayers in Ephesians and in the other epistles too, uh, we see uh, that he is far more concerned with the spiritual and with the eternal. You see, where the uh, spiritual is in good order, And where the eternal is the focus, then the material and the physical and the temporal will, I say carefully, take care of itself. Because where we have a God in the right position and where we have eternity in its right perspective, then the temporal and the physical and uh, the material will be put in its right perspective as well. And so in chapter 1, he prayed such things that the eyes of their understanding would be enlightened, that they might know the hope of his calling, uh, that God might give them the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, that they might know the exceeding greatness of his power, uh, etc., etc. And so he prays that kind of prayer for them. And he's going to pray another prayer for them again. And again, uh, we can uh, reflect on what he says uh, and ask ourselves, are those kind of things being seen and known in our hearts and lives as well? And so I want to notice, first of all, uh, his attitude in verse number 14. His attitude in verse 14. He says this, For this reason I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. What is he doing? He's reflecting on the greatness of the revelation given to him. And in response to that, he bows his knees. In response to that, he is humbled and he's brought to an attitude of worship. That's a challenge, isn't it? When does the reflection upon the greatness of who God is and the greatness of what he's done bring us to an attitude of humility and worship. I was speaking to uh, someone just recently uh, and they had been uh, asked to do something in the Lord's work and 
they said uh, they, th they, they, they said to me that uh, they struggle with pride sometimes and uh, this was a position where it would be uh, known by others that uh, they would be in that position and uh, they just said uh, to pray that th there wouldn't be that sense of pride lifted up and I said go and have a little look at what Paul says in Ephesians chapter 3 because in Ephesians chapter 3, uh, the Apostle Paul recognises the greatness of the privilege of what he had been given. But as he recognises the greatness of the privilege, that is tempered and that is uh, contrasted with the sense of humility that is brought, that why would God choose him to do that? Why would God ever call us into such a position where we are be called to handle the unsearchable riches of Christ? And yes, there is the temptation to be lifted up in pride as God would give a service to do, but that should be absolutely countered as we recognise the magnificent and the mag mag majesty of the message and the work that has been given. And the absolute unworthiness of ourselves to be called to such a work. And so the Apostle Paul uh, would say in verse number 8. To me, who am less than the least of all the saints, this grace was given. This gift was given. Any time that we are called to serve God. Any time that we are privileged to speak for God. There can be nothing of pride in it. For it is only of God that the opportunities are given. It is only of God that any ability is given. It is only of God that any grace is given. There's no room at all for pride as we remember the grace shown to us and the majesty of the one of whom we speak. I was speaking to uh, the children uh, on Monday last week about the subject of service. Uh, and we just looked at uh, the disciples as they were called. And how often the disciples uh, would speak amongst themselves wanting to be the greatest. And how that the Lord Jesus would have to uh, continually remind them. That in order to be the greatest in his kingdom. They had to serve. They had to become small. And so he would take a child and would say if you want to be greatest in my kingdom. You need to be willing to serve the child. Then John and James would come to him uh, with their mother and their mother would say, uh, I want John and James to sit one on your right hand and one on your left hand when you come into your kingdom. And what does the Lord Jesus respond? He says, are you able to suffer as much as me? And he says, if you're going to be greatest in my kingdom, you need to be willing to serve the smallest and you need to be willing to suffer the greatest. And then uh, as the disciples would come to uh, that, that mill and there would be no servant to wash the feet. And so no one gets up and washes the feet. Because they've just been speaking along the way who's the greatest. And so as they've been speaking about who the greatest and then they're faced no servant to wash the feet. None of them are going to be prepared to get down and wash the other's feet. And so they sit through the whole meal. Till the Lord Jesus gets up and lays aside his outer garment, becomes dressed like the servant slave and goes and gets the water and washes the feet of all. And he gets up at the end and says, do you know what I've done to you? He says, listen, if you're going to be the greatest in the kingdom of God, you need to be willing to serve like the son of God. You need to be willing to get on your hands and knees to be able to be willing to wash the feet of your fellow brothers and sisters. Because what did the Lord Jesus say? For even the Son of Man. Is come not to be served. But to serve. And to give his life. A ransom for many. What was the attitude of the Lord Jesus? It was to serve the smallest. It was to be willing to suffer the greatest. It was to be willing to give his life. For the good of others. Here's the humility of the Lord Jesus Christ. Here's the humility of the Apostle Paul. 
as they consider just the greatness of what they are called uh, to come. And so he says, for this reason I bow my knees. I bow my knees. He's brought to a position of humility and of worship for the greatness of what God has done. And so he says in verse number 15, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. Now there's probably about, uh, there's at least two or three different uh, explanations uh, for what uh, for what this means when it says from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named um, and I think each one has uh, has a point but I think in the context I would suggest to you that he's been speaking of Jew and Gentile being brought into one family being brought into this great body the church and he bows his knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and in earth is named. And I just wonder whether he's saying this, listen, I'm bowing my knees before the God and Father into whose family we've all been called. Whether Jew or Gentile, bond or free, male or female. We've been born again and now we are called under the name of the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And there's some in heaven. Because they've been called home. There's still some on earth. But here's the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And he's the God and Father of all the redeemed. And again the Apostle Paul is just emphasising to us. That it doesn't matter where we have come from. If we're saved. Then we have the same Father. We have the Father of our Lord, Jesus Christ. And so we see the attitude of the Apostle Paul. He bows his knees. And may it be that we, as we go out into another week, are brought to reflect upon what God has done and are brought to a place of humility and worship before our Father. But then I want you to notice his confidence, his confidence, in verse number 16, he begins his prayer for the Ephesian believers. And he says, that he would grant you. Just miss the next little phrase uh, and go, uh, uh, go down to the, ne uh, to, to the next phrase. And he would grant you to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man. So his prayer is this, that they be strengthened. But I want you to notice his confidence in the little phrase that we missed out. His confidence. It says that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory. According to the riches of his glory. Just meditate upon that phrase for a moment. Just think, uh, can, you, can, can, you, can you bring to mind or can you just uh, try and uh, comprehend what we mean when we speak about the glory of God? The word glory has the idea of weightiness, solidity, reality. That which is worth something. And as we think of the glory of God, we think of all of the sum, all of the bringing together of his attributes. And we see just how worthy of praise and honour God is. So he contemplates the majesty of his love, the greatness of his knowledge, the wonder of his power, the greatness of the fact that he is everywhere at all times. And that's just four of his attributes. And as you contemplate the greatness of who he is, you see something of his glory. And as you see something of his glory as you bring together the sum total of all that he is. And Paul is now going to be praying that God would do something in their lives. What does he say? According to the riches of his glory. The abundant wealth. The superaboundingness of the greatness of who God is. 
Can there be any doubt that the God to whom he's praying can do what he's going to ask? Can there be any doubt about that at all? No, of course not. Because you only need to meditate upon just how glorious he is. And just the superabundance of that glory. To know that whatever Paul prays, there is the possibility of it being brought about. And so we see his confidence. We see the storehouse out of which God would do what he is praying. So we see his attitude of humility and worship. We see his confidence and now we see his desire for the believers. We see his desire for the believers. Number one, that they be strengthened with might through the inner man. Strengthened with might through the inner man. Notice again at the focus upon the spiritual. Here were believers who would have been faced with opposition and persecution. That might have been faced with beating and even with death. But what is the prayer of the apostle? The prayer of the apostle is that they be empowered in the inner man. They be strengthened with might. That they be given power to live for God. And how is that going to be accomplished? It says that they might be given power, that they might be strengthened through the Spirit in the inner man. You see, the Apostle Paul would speak in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 4. He would speak about this broken vessel. This vessel of clay that we have. And he was speaking about the body. And he was saying, listen, what happens is this outer body, it breaks down, it gets weak. Now that may just be simply uh, through uh, natural causes and sickness and older age and uh, the natural running down of the body. Or it might be through persecution and opposition. That this body of ours is brought to a low point and is increasingly shown to be weak. But in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, the Apostle Paul rejoices in the fact that that happens to him. Because he says, the more that this body of mine is broken, and yet the more that I can keep going and show Christ, the more it displays the glory and the light of God. The more it shows and demonstrates the power of God. Because he says, in a natural, physical way, way, I would not be able to keep going and I would not be able to live for God and display Christ in the way that I am. It has to be a divine work that is going on. And he says, just like John the Baptist, I must decrease and he must increase. The apostle's great desire was that Christ be seen in him. And so he says, if Christ is going to be seen in me, I need to be strengthened. I need to be empowered in the inner man. That that new man that I am, that is displaying Christ, that is what needs to be empowered. And so the apostles' first prayer is that that which might display Christ is that which be strengthened in us. And so he says, uh, number one, not just he prays for strength, but he prays for fellowship too. He prays for fellowship. Verse number 17. That Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. That Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. You see, if it is that we are going to display Christ and the inner man is going to uh, show Christ in character, then we need the strength of the Spirit, but we need fellowship with Christ himself. In 2 Corinthians chapter 3, it tells us that we will be changed from glory to glory. In other words, we'll be brought more like Christ the more we behold him. The more we gaze upon him, the more that we get to know him, the more that we spend time in his presence, the more we will be changed from glory to glory. You know, the Lord Jesus Christ wants to spend every day in our hearts. And in, two, and in Revelation chapter 3, uh, the Lord Jesus speaks to a church there called Laodicea. And 
at Laodicea, they are just lukewarm. You know, when you have a cold drink, it refreshes. When you have a hot drink, it brings warmth and refreshment. A lukewarm drink is kind of just disgusting. It's neither hot or cold. And um, you, you drink it, and you might just kind of tolerate it, but the temptation, especially if you're not expecting it to be lukewarm, would be to spit it out of your mouth. And the Lord Jesus says to the, the church at Laodicea, he says, listen, you're lukewarm. It's like I want to spew you out of my mouth. There's nothing of refreshment. There's nothing of desire. There's nothing of passion. You're neither cold nor hot. But he says, I stand at the door and knock. The Lord Jesus presents this picture of standing at the heart of every single believer, knocking and knocking and knocking. This is not the coming into the heart, if we can use that expression of salvation. Really, uh, the idea of coming into the heart in the scriptures is not so much salvation, but it's, it's the idea of the Lord Jesus knocking, wanting to come there every day to have fellowship. It's like you opening the door of your inner man uh, every single day in order that you might communicate and have fellowship with Christ. It's like something that we do every day that as we wake up, the Lord comes and he knocks. Are you going to let me in today? Are you going to uh, communicate with me? And um, there's another word beginning with C which has gone out of my mind, which means have, have a communion. Are you going to have communion with me today? Are you, are you going to learn of me? Are you going to spend time with me? And the Apostle Paul, he prays that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. Through faith. And so day by day we wake up and by faith we welcome the Lord Jesus into communion and fellowship with ourselves. Why? Why, why does the Apostle Paul pray this? Well, his desire is, is that they be displaying Christ. And they need the power of the Spirit, but they need the fellowship with Christ day by day as well. Then thirdly, what does he pray? He prays for uh, that they be rooted and grounded in love. You see, uh, as uh, and, and he, he prays for, for knowledge. So that, that little expression, being rooted and grounded in love, uh, kind of leads into the next little verse, uh, which which is the Apostle Paul is praying that they might know that, 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 they, that, they, sorry, that they might have knowledge that they might have knowledge. You see, feelings and emotions come and go, don't they? If you're anything like me, you can be up here one day and down here the next day, uh, and the desire is to uh, be kind of steady uh, and the peaks and the troughs to not be too uh, high or too low. You see, the emotions can take us on a roller coaster ride. And so, what the Apostle Paul prays for is that they might have knowledge. Number one, knowledge of God's love. He wants them to be rooted and grounded, that the foundation of uh, going forward in their life, the foundation for whatever they face, is that they be rooted and grounded in love. The love of God, the love for one another. That they might be absolutely certain through what Christ has done. That they are loved by God. You know it's a great and wonderful thing isn't it? To be loved by someone. And it's a great and wonderful thing to be absolutely certain you're loved by that person. You know in the early days of a relationship you can tell one another that you love each other. And then over time, there's a demonstration of actions which lend weight to the words. And then there's a demonstration of challenges that come to the relationship, but you still stick together. And that adds another layer to the confidence that you can be rooted and grounded in love. So when we come to God, we see not just words, but actions. And we see the depth to which Christ was willing to come. 
and we can be rooted and grounded in love. That the foundation upon which we move out in our lives is the love of God. And having been grounded in that love, he says that you may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and length and depth and height. Now, I don't believe that that width, depth, height and length is speaking about the love of God. Because he's just spoken about being rooted and grounded in love. He's going to speak in verse 19 that they know experimentally that love of Christ. And so I think the width and length and depth and height is speaking about something different. He wants them to know something. He wants them to be able to comprehend, to be able to grasp, to lay hold upon. And I would suggest to you, he's speaking about what he's just been teaching them. He's just spoken to them of the demonstration of the manifold uh, wisdom of God in the church. And now he wants them to understand the wideness of that. Comprehend it. Get a hold of the wonder of what God is doing in building Jew and Gentile into one church. I want you to notice the wideness of God's grace, he says. It encompasses you all. And he says, if you can get a hold of that, then you'll never get a, uh, you'll never get a sense that you're a second class citizen in the people of God. If you can get a hold of that, it will empower you to go out and preach to the whosoever. Because you will comprehend the wideness of the grace of God and the work of God in what he's doing. But then he says, I want you to comprehend the length of it. He says, listen, this work that God is doing, it's not only encompassing all people, but it's a work that is for eternity. And he says, I want you to comprehend this by knowledge that when your emotions are going up and down, when it feels like God has left you and deserted you, when it feels like you're just facing death and disaster here, he says, I want you to lay hold upon this fact that the length of the work that God is doing is for eternity. That the work that God is doing here and now on this earth might just encompass you for a moment. But it's all part of an eternal work that God is doing. And that when God's work with you on this earth ends, it's only the beginning of an eternal work that God is doing for an eternity. A sense in which you can't really divide the two. Because the work that God is doing in us now is just the beginning of the work that's going to go on and on and on. He says, get a hold of this. Because it's going to help you face the temporal, the physical and the material when you recognise and understand the length of the work that God is doing. Because so often we want God to move and work now, don't we? We want God to do something and to finish his purposes now so that we understand them all. But he says, no, I want you to get a hold of the fact that God works on an eternal scale, not just on a time scale. I want you to understand the width and the length and the depth and the depth. What was the depth to which Christ was prepared to go in order that he might accomplish this great work of building his church? The great depth to which he was prepared to go was the darkness of Calvary. It was to the suffering and the shame of the cross. It was to be willing to enter into death and be placed in the tomb. It was willing to enter into that separation with his God. It was his willingness to go to the darkness and the depths of Calvary. Where those three hours of darkness would come. And he would bear our sins in his own body upon the tree. He says, do you want to know? Do you want to know something of the manifold wisdom of God? Do you want to know that you are secure? Do you want to know that you are loved? Do you want to know that God will accomplish his work? Just look at the depth to which Christ went. Just look at the extent to which Christ was prepared to give himself. And you will know that God is not going to give up. You will know that God is not going to desert you now. 
You will know that when Christ says, I will build my church, he will do it because he wouldn't have gone to such depths if he was going to give up partway through. And then he says that you might know the height, the height. What did he say in chapter 2 and verse number 6? In two, chapter 2 verse 6 he said this, that he has raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ. How high are we brought? We're brought to the very throne of God. We're brought to be the very bride of Christ. We're brought to the position where we're in Christ and Christ is there at the right hand of God. We're sat with him in heavenly places. So the Apostle Paul, he says this, his great desire and prayer is that they be strengthened in the inner man, that they have fellowship with Christ, and that they might have knowledge, so that they be rooted and grounded in love, and that they might comprehend the greatness of what God is doing. Because as they comprehend the greatness of what God is doing in all of its dimensions, so that will enable them to remain steadfast and sure upon the way of that they are called to go. And then he says this, and to know the love of Christ which passeth knowledge. To know the love of Christ which passeth knowledge. You know, it's a kind of play on words here, isn't it? How can you know something that's past knowledge? Here is a love which surpasses any knowledge, but he says, it surpasses full knowledge. But he says, I want you to know it. I want you to know it by experience. And so as we are rooted and grounded in love, that we know that we're loved, we know the full, or we come to grasp something of the full um, dimensions of the work that God is doing. And so we're then prepared to walk for God. And as we walk for God, we're going to get a sense of the greatness of the love that Christ has for us. And his prayer is not that they just know up in their minds and academically the love of Christ. But his great prayer is that as they live in the knowledge of what God has done for them and what God is doing for them and what God is doing on a great and eternal scale, that they walk for him through thick and thin and through thick and thin they will gradually learn by experience the surpassing love of Christ. So he goes on to say, to know the love of Christ which passeth knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Here's the great purpose, that they be filled with all the fullness of God. That doesn't mean, of course, that they're going to become God. No. But that in their life, that they might know something of the manifold character, the manifold work, the manifold wisdom, the manifold love, the manifold power of God, that they might know that pouring out of blessedness that the Apostle Paul is praying, that they might experience something of the fullness of God. I wonder if we experience something of that in our lives. Perhaps there's been moments where we've we, we've, we've experienced practically through some circumstance and situation just we've experienced God in a way that is deeper and fuller than we'd ever done before. The Apostle Paul's prayer for the people of God is this, that they be filled with all the fullness of God. We see now why the Apostle Paul is praying such prayers because if we're filled with all the fullness of God then that's going to prepare us for whatever this world throws at us. Because if God is for us then who can be against us he says in Romans and chapter 8. You say Paul this is a huge prayer. Paul this is a prayer that that, that, that doesn't seem possible that it would be able to be fulfilled in my life. It just seems such a big thing to be able to enter into such a thing as you're praying. 
What does the Apostle Paul say? He says this. As he ends his prayer. He's going to end his prayer on a note of worship and adoration. But through the note of adoration and worship, he's going to encourage us as well. Because what does he say? Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think. You see, the God to whom we come is the God who is able to work in ways that we just cannot imagine. And as you look down through the centuries, the people of God can lay testimony to this fact, that they prayed about a situation. They desired God to work in a situation, and oftentimes they had in their mind the way they wanted God to work. And he didn't do it their way. He did it a different way. And as they look back, they can see that he did it in a way that was exceedingly abundantly above all that they asked or thought. You see, the God to whom we come is the God who has greater knowledge than we give him credit for. He is the God who has greater wisdom than we credit him for. He is the God who has greater power than perhaps we credit him for. And while we say in theory that our God is all powerful and is able to do anything. I wonder how often I just bring him short and seek to put him in a box with a power that I can comprehend. Instead of allowing God to be God. And so he's able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us. What is that power that works in us? It's a power that's already raised us from the dead. Chapter 2. We who were dead in trespasses and in sins, God has now made us alive and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ. The power that works in us is a power that is resurrection power. Life-giving power. A power that cannot be seen by anyone else in this universe. And it's a power that we've seen to some degree already. And so the Apostle Paul says this, listen, I'm praying great things for you. But listen, this is a God who's already done great things in your life. This is a God who's already given you life where there was death. This is a God who's already brought light where there was darkness. Have full confidence that he, like the Apostle Paul, has full confidence that he is able to do this. Why? In verse 21, to him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. You see, God is going to get glory to his name through the church. That is what he is doing. Christ says, I will build my church. And when the church is complete, and when the church is revealed with Christ, then glory will be brought to the name of God. You see, to him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations. And as each succeeding generation goes by, God will get glory to his name through the church. Yes, we mess up. And yes, there's times when... Uh, when the angelic beings, as they look on, must despair. As they see the, 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 the failings that we have and how that we fail to allow God to work in us in a way that brings glory to his name in the church. But let me tell you this, that God is bringing glory to his name through the church. And while we may not be able to comprehend it, and while we may despair, we can rejoice in this, that God is doing the work that he set out to do, because nothing can stop him, and no one can stop him. The gates of hell cannot prevail against it. And it's to all generations. It's not just looking back that a previous generation we can say, oh yes, the church was strong then and brought glory to God. It's to all generations. The possibility is now. In fact, it's more than a possibility. God is bringing glory now. The challenge, I suppose, is this. The challenge is this. Is that as we perhaps reflect upon our own demonstration of the church of God in our locality. Are there things that we recognise ought to be different? And ways in which the name of God could be glorified more? God will work. 
but we should also be sensitive to where we might need to be changing so that more glory might be able to be brought. And so as we go out into another week, may we be encouraged. May we pray for each other that we be strengthened. That Christ may dwell in our hearts. That we might be rooted and grounded in love. That we might gain just a little bit more knowledge of the wideness, depth and length and breadth of the work of God. May it be that we experimentally this week know the love of Christ which passeth all understanding. May it be that this week, in whatever God brings us through, that we experience the fullness of God in our life. These are big things. But praise God, we have a God who is abundantly able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think. He will get glory to his name. No doubt about that. But may it be that we become willing partners. And where he speaks to us where we need to change, that we are prepared to do that, shall we pray. Our God, we're grateful that you have revealed such great things to us through your word. And our Father, we pray that you would help us to uh, revel in the greatness of what you have done. We pray that you'd help us to, uh, to, to believe how great you are and the greatness of what you are doing and the greatness of what you can do in our hearts as well. And so, our God, you know the help that each of us will need through this coming week. You know where we need to change and what we need to do. And our God and our Father, we pray that you would just be pleased to bless, help and encourage. As our God, we commend one another to you in the precious name of the Lord Jesus. Amen.